thank you very much. Um, no, I'm just trying to this going. Right. Um, when I saw that this conference was dedicated to David Pallet, I thought it would be nice to um, try to connect some of the things that I'm saying to things that he has done. And I found essentially the same um, picture on the web as Professor Mariani showed, except mine only goes up to 1998, but for my purposes it doesn't really matter. Um, and it shows that um, not too bad for small vocabularies and various types of speech are really still not very well understood by machines, which you all know. And I tried to relate that to the invitation that I was given because when I was first invited here, I couldn't really see why I'd been invited because I don't really work on speech errors. Um, I try to work more on the opposite, which is speech correctnesses. Um, but these are the sorts of things that they uh, took off my website and, sorry, and decided that, uh, suggested you would be interested in hearing about. And I'm going to be focusing um, not so much on illusions today because they're a lot of fun, but I thought for this particular group, if you don't know about them, there are things on the web that you can go to um, to listen. And it might be more useful if I tried to sort of push my own thinking forward into ways that might help you solve some of the sorts of problems you're talking about with respect to pruning and that sort of thing. So I'm going to be focusing mainly on um, this first question, are the levels and units of standard linguistic description essential to the process of speech recognition, or are they more reasonably considered as byproducts of a general pattern matching process? And I'll be touching on the other two, what can sensory illusions tell us about the way the brain interprets the speech signal, and how do perceptual responses vary according to the style of speech and the task participants are given. But I'll be doing those last two in a sort of circular way and sometimes rather more implicit. Um, and so what I'll be talking about is pattern completion, prediction, task specificity, and across all of those contexts, contexts sensitivity in various different ways. Um, the word essential um, is, is probably an overstatement. I think it might be fair to say that very little is actually essential in, um, in a spoken communication, unless you're talking about something whose content is really important and it isn't there in the environment, and then obviously, um, so you can't gesture towards it or something. So obviously then it's essential. Um, so I've put on this slide the word essential in, in brackets, uh, sorry, not brackets, quotes the whole time. Um, and I'll use it, but I don't mean that it's really absolutely obligatory at every stage. Um, what I'm going to propose then is that um, units of linguistic description are essential if they help you to get to the meaning, but not necessarily otherwise unless the task is something I call metalinguistic, which is the sort of psycholinguistic experiment of is this a word or is it not a word? Is this the phoneme B or is this the phoneme D? And, and so on. Then, of course, those units are essential. But um, a lot of the time, they're probably not. So I would suggest that phonemes are not essential to understanding speech. They are undoubtedly extremely useful in helping researchers code information in a way that allows us to communicate with each other about that information um, very efficiently. But they don't themselves help word identification in any way that's not already encoded in the signal, for example, as an allophone. On the other hand, grammatical morphemes probably are essential because they do bear an independent meaning. And some morphemes in most languages, I think, are the, the languages that have morphemes, not all of them do, but um, some morphemes are, of course, single phonemes, but that is completely irrelevant to this particular issue of trying to relate units to meanings. Um, I would also like to suggest that prosodic phrasing seems likely to be essential, but to my horror, Julia said it wasn't. Um, so we, I will, um, I've been rewriting little bits and pieces to try and make my point of view a bit clearer. Um, um, 
Well, just taking a sort of, you know, cartoon of what you said, um, <laughs> you did say that prosody didn't seem as important as some, as, uh, at least of some of the... Yes, and that was to my horror, is what I heard. <laughs> and um, because it does distinguish meaningful chunks, and it does, of course, a lot of other things as well, as Julia knows extremely well. Um, so uh, it's an interesting, it, it was very interesting that she said it didn't seem to carry um, as much importance as the other things that she was looking at. And um, I'm going to be trying to suggest some ways in which we might think about that and, and exploit that information in a way that might ultimately be useful in about 50 years from now. So first of all, phonemes then. Well, phoneme theory, which was a, um, came out of linguistics, is um, something that aims very much at parsimony. It is the dominant model for phonology and phonetics um, for the last 50 or 70 years or something. And it's been adopted by a lot of other disciplines, pretty uncritically, in fact. Um, and it's now traditional in both theory and applications because of its strengths, namely it's parsimonious and people who are using it can easily understand it. So you can come with very little information about what phonemes are and think that you understand them pretty well. Um, you do not need to appreciate um, phoneme theory's original purpose, which was to provide a very elegant and tight system of the, the, the basic contrast system um, within a given language. And um, as a consequence, you don't tend to be particularly thoughtful about the limitations that that approach has for particular applications that are to do with things that humans do, um, as opposed to human sound systems. The acoustic signal, as you well know, and much of language structure, particularly grammar, is highly redundant. And so to use a system that is based on parsimony seems to me to make a very poor basis for the building blocks of a communicative system. Phonemes, by definition, are context-free, whereas we all know here in this room that speech units are context-sensitive. And you may or may not know that um, things like categorical perception, which you've probably heard of, boundaries shift quite considerably sometimes, depending on the um, statistical distribution of what is in the signal and whether the word, you've got a word in the, in the signal or a non-word and so on. Boundaries are extremely malleable, you know, sound, sound category boundaries. There is very little actual evidence that people use phonemes in understanding speech. And um, that is not just something I believe, but it's been very elegantly um, pointed out fairly recently by Sophie Scott and her colleagues. Uh, so why do we interpret de data as we do? Well, um, this is a bit rude in a way, but I think it's true. It's typically implicitly assumed that <coughs> units experimenters think about when they're planning experiments and designing stimuli are... Um, it's, it's assumed that those units are those that the listening brain uses. But that, of course, is a grievous mistake, and you see that in experiments quite often. It's also assumed that shorter units are identified before longer units. Let's look at both of these things in a bit more detail. If we take the sound R, you can consider it, it's actually a phone, but you consider it, can consider it to be a phoneme, and there's no damage done if you do that. But it's also the nucleus of a syllable, and because that syllable has no coda or consonant following, then it's the rhyme of the syllable. Because it has no onset, it's also a whole syllable in itself. It's also, in English, a word, and if, it's also, if it's said in a meaningful context, um, it will form a complete, well-formed intonational phrase. And so this statement here is true for quite a few vowels in English. Um, these are some meanings that um, individual vowels can have. They are phonemes, but they're also entire utterances or bits of utterances. Some of them mean have word meanings associated with them. Quite a few of them are interjections. In French, you get the same sort of thing happening. There's an awful lot of these are um, 
parts of speech that uh, tell you things about verbs and verb tenses and singularity of plural and so on. But there are also um, various words that mean things in there as well. French being somewhat more ambiguous about these things than even than English is. So that takes us then to the second point that I made, which is shorter units are assumed often to be identified as longer units, uh, but before longer units. Well, we have to consider, first of all, what shorter means when we're talking about units of linguistic description from linguistic theory. Usually they're interpreted as this phrase, uh, in terms of levels and lower levels, with phonemes being lower than syllables lower than words, lower than phrases, and so on. But it's important to remember that formal linguistic units don't have duration. Duration's never been particularly well um, represented in linguistic theory. Even those that have tried to do it, they can represent relationships between durations, but not um, it within, within a same type of um, sequence. But they can't actually um, really reflect the complexity of the durational information that people in this room probably are very well aware of. Now, I just thought, I'm not going to labour that, but it's worth pointing out that physically some syllables are shorter than some phones. So, re in repair is shorter than the s in dis of dismiss, even though they're both in unstressed syllables. Um, and I checked that out before I wrote it up there. It's not just hand-waving. And I'll be talking about some of this data in a little while. But um, some people ask me to do this thing. It has, um, I'm going to be talking about different ways of saying you don't know things. Does anyone not know this example? Because I'll skip it if you... Anyone not know this example? Okay, then I I'll, I'll won't skip it in that case. Um, these are three pretty ordinary ways of saying... Um, I, I ask because I've said it a lot, many, many times I've done this example. Um, these are three ways of saying that you lack some information in a um, fairly neutral sort of way. And then if you want to be a little bit less neutral, you actually separate the words out. So instead of saying, I don't know, or I don't know, or don't know, you say, I do not know. And if you say, I do not know, um, you can't usually say it like that. You have to put something extra in there um, to give it some meaning. And the type of meaning that would normally come over is a sort of warning to the person that's asking you for the information that's saying, look, you've asked me two or three times now and I do not know. So stop asking, please. And it's getting, to, getting root. If you put spaces between the words, I do not know. Then if the person continues to ask, then there's war. Um, so there's a lot of meaning up here, which is giving the questioner a huge amount of information about what to do next, namely change their behavior. Stop asking the question or ask it in a more helpful way or something like that. Down at the other extreme, we have various reductions. This is I don't know, and this one is I don't know. And um, it has, however, the right shape for I don't know. It starts with a wide mouth and ends with a narrower mouth. It's got nasality in it. It's got a particular, rather fossilized, um, prosodic structure. And in the right context, it's highly meaningful. The right context is the sort of thing where you know the person very well, you're very comfortable with each other. Perhaps you come home, your partner is sitting in a chair reading a book, and you say, do you know where the newspaper is? And she goes, oh, and you know that she has processed that information. She, you know that she's not grunting, because if she had said, oh, which is the opposite <coughs> of this one, um, or mm, then she may or may not have processed the information. But if she says, oh, especially shrugs one shoulder or something, then and doesn't take her nose out of the book, you know the book is more interesting to her than finding the newspaper is. And that changes your behavior. Instead of just saying again a bit louder, do you know where the newspaper is? You say, because that movie that we were talking about is on in the um, downtown, and I want to check what time it is, because maybe we've got time to get there, at which point she might if she wants to go to the movie, help you find the newspaper. So the point is that these two types of utterance 
like these ones, all say that you lack information. But the ones at the top and the ones at the bottom are very rich in meaning and they provide very few polite responses. So they very much govern what people in interaction do next. Whereas these ones are much more neutral and there are a huge number of polite responses that can come afterwards, including repetition of what just went before. Whereas in these cases, it is impolite to repeat what went before. If you want to have a successful interaction, you're going to change what you said. Okay? Um, so it's also inconceivable to me that if somebody says, I don't know, in the right context, so that it's completely understandable, that the listener has to extract the separate words, extract the separate phonemes and so on to work out that the person doesn't know where the newspaper is. Of course they don't do that. They just take this chunk of sound and in that very constrained context they say, okay, this person doesn't know where the newspaper is. So the situation and the function of the utterance determine what type of phonetic detail you use and therefore probably determine the perceived units. Here you are perceiving words almost certainly as, long as, as, as well as other things, but down here you're almost certainly not perceiving words. You're just going straight to the meaning which you could then translate later in saying, well, you said you didn't know, but it isn't actually what the person said, it's what they meant. Okay, and there are many, many arguments that develop um, based on what somebody remembered as somebody saying and other people remember something different because what we all actually remember is the meaning and that is also, um, that is established in psycholinguistic experiments. So that's phonemes trashed. Um, here I want to talk about grammatical morphemes and whether or not they're essential or not. Um, this is an eye-tracking experiment that was reported in the Hong Kong ICPHS. The analyses are completed now and they're better than they were in the ICPHS paper, um, but the paper's still in preparation, I'm sorry about that. Um, what we did was take words in pairs of picturable sentences um, that were identical up to the critical word and sometimes afterwards and had the same rhythm and intonation in the rest of the sentence. So the sentences were things like a swan displaces water when it lands, a swan displays its plumage to its mate. And the dis here is a true morpheme. When you remove dis from displaces, it means sort of the opposite of places. But here this dis is a pseudomorpheme. It looks much the same, um, but it when you remove it from plays, it doesn't mean the opposite of plays. And so what we've got is a contrast here between um, two syllables that are phonemically identical but morphemically different, and they are acoustically slightly different as well. If you're a non-native speaker, you probably won't hear the difference, and if you're a native speaker, you've probably never noticed the difference, but it is, it is there, and we've done uh, quite a large study to prove that people do do it, and it's there entrenched within all sort of phonological theory as well. We cross-spliced these sorts of sentences to produce four experimental sentences, two which were right um, or matches and two which were wrong or mismatches. Um, we cross-spliced them by taking the first part of one sentence and if we're making a match, we'd take the same sentence and splice the second half onto it and for the, uh, the same with the pseudomorpheme. For the uh, mismatches or the wrong ones, we take the first half of, say, this sentence and splice the second half of that sentence onto it. So we made, for each original pair, we'd recorded several different utterances and we spliced them, so we ended up with four pairs using four original sentences, two of this type and two of that type. Um, they sounded like this. This is a match with a pseudomorpheme. A swan displays its plumage to its mate. That's a spliced sentence, and this is the alternative. A swan displaces water when it lands. And the mismatches sound like this. A swan displaces water when it lands. Which probably sounds fine to quite a lot of you, um, but this one, if you're listening carefully, to my mind has a bigger bump on it because it's got the it's got the prefix dis, which is acoustically different. A swan displaces plumage to its mate. It should be a swan displaces and it's a swan displaces 
And that's, it's that difference that we're interested in. And the question that we asked is, okay, it's very trivial, but theoretically and in terms of what brains are doing, it's extremely important um, because um, well, the question is, are people processing that difference such that they can use it predictively in a listening situation when they don't need to? Because, of course, listening here, you can wait until everything is disambiguated with the much clearer information that comes. So, people had a calibration. It was an eye-tracking experiment, remember? People had a calibration to look at. They saw two pictures for a couple of seconds, and then they heard just one of these sentences. And the task was to click on the right picture. It was a very, very easy task, in other words, because these are simply not difficult, not difficult um, sentences, and the listening conditions were as clear as you've heard them just now. Um, it was a very complicated design, which I'm not going to go into for reasons of time and because you're probably not that interested in those details. Um, so this is just a schematic summary of the things that are important for the point I'm trying to make now. Um, these, each of these blobs is a syllable, with one being the first syllable in time and the two being the second syllable in time of the critical word. When the splice syllables were all matches in the first session, so people were hearing what they normally hear, then they did look at the um, correct picture during the dis or, or the miss, um, depending on what the prefix was. When the splice syllables were all mismatches in session one, they did not look eventually, they, they got confused and did funny things to some extent, and the basic um, pattern of what, what they were looking at was they started to differentiate in their looks during the second syllable, at the beginning of the second syllable. Now, we also had another set of stimuli in there, which varied um, in, it was a, a, another prefix, re, um, and in, as in restring, that contrasted with word pairs like restrict. So you can restring your violin, um, or you can restring your tennis racket, and you can restrict um, information going to NSA. Um, and these stimuli, unlike these ones, differ in phoneme as well. This is re, and this varies between re and r in the accent that we're talking about. And here, people looked a lot later. Although, in this case, we've only got one contrast, which is the phoneme, uh, sorry, the morpheme, the phonemes are the same. And in this case, we've got two contrasts. So, strictly speaking, if you're thinking about linguistic units, it should have been a stronger contrast. But the, um, the re and the dis, um, the, sorry, re is, is, is um, takes longer to say than, than the dis. Re is shorter than dis is, both types of dis, but re is longer. And if in English, if you make a re syllable or any e syllable very short, people tend to hear it as the other phoneme, e. So the differences here are that we've got a morphemic contrast only here, not a phonemic one, and the information is, is systematically distributed in the signal according to the way that the listeners had heard it all the previous years of their life. Whereas in this case with the mismatches, it was systematically distributed, but it was the opposite of what people were expecting based on what they'd heard for their previous years of existence. And so we got a different type of behavior occurring, per perfectly intelligent behavior. And in this case, people knew from their past experience that um, re is long, and you simply can't differentiate it. Um, there were probably one or two other factors in here as well, but the phonemic difference was causing the um, differentiation in when the looks to the right picture occurred. It, they, it caused it to be delayed. So, I can conclude then that um, listeners were using the acoustic information predictively when it met their expectations, when it was systematically distributed, even though there was absolutely no need to because they could just sit around and wait until the next syllable um, and the rest of the sentence before they had to click. They didn't get an electric shock or anything if they clicked more slowly. It was a laid back sort of experiment. And um, so this was quite interesting that the brain is monitoring this very fine level of detail um, when there's some point to doing it. There was no evidence that prediction was helped by a phoneme change, as in restring versus restrict, um, for the reasons that I've just explained. 
whereas those subphonemic effects in Dis and Miss, um, which take less time to be used in real time, were being used predictively. And what I want to extrapolate from that is that each of these syllables, the two different disses, has a very clear internal acoustic structure, which is quite different. In the prefix, there's a lot more periodicity and rather less aperiodicity compared with in the non-prefix, the pseudo-prefix. And if you can use that behavior, uh, sorry, use that internal structure, then it can influence your predictions more, apparently, than the presence of the phonemic contrast. And so I'm suggesting that maybe these prefixes form distinct auditory objects because they are distinct from other syllables that look much the same and they have meaning attached to them. So to try and make that um, clear in a visual way, what we were looking at before was syllable one, syllable two, with the stress pattern um, being uh, represented by the size of the blob, so syllable two is, is more heavily stressed than syllable one. But if we turn this now into auditory objects, we have the green things are prefixes and the purple things are word stems. So words like displace and discolor have two auditory objects because they've got prefixes, and words like display and discover are only one auditory object. The same overall pattern, but different details inside um, each of these syllables that will allow people to use that expected internal structure to do pattern completion. So, as a sort of interim summary, um, phonemes don't appear to be good candidates for an obligatory perceptual unit. Morphemes may be, and what about words? They obviously bear meaning. And despite having variable edges due to things like morphology and connected speech processes, the middle bits are relatively stable in most European languages at least. Um, the edges also have their own transitional probabilities and so they make pretty good candidates for being auditory objects. But there are some problems with them when you start thinking in detail about particular words. Um, the uh, lexical meanings don't bear a particularly close relationship to many sentence meanings. Many word meanings are very strongly contextually defined and obvious sentence meaning may not reflect function. So if we take a sentence like, give me a break, and think what that means, um, we have to conclude that understanding someone else's speech isn't so much stringing together simple units like words as actively constructing what the speaker meant from whatever information is available. So if you're in a bike shop, this break could actually be a bicycle break. Um, if you've got a person who's a bit tired, it's about taking a rest. Um, if you've got a person who thinks life hasn't treated them very kindly recently, um, then they might want life to be kinder to them and given um, an opportunity. And if it's a teenager, then it's uh, a completely different thing and he's just saying, oh, give me a break. Um, so, if we think about these things then as auditory objects, each of these words might be an auditory object, but I'd also like to suggest in just a sort of hand wavy way that give me a might be an auditory object as well, um, because it can occur with a whole lot of other auditory objects, some of which might sound the same as each other, but they mean quite different things, and that meaning will be contextually determined. So all these three meanings comprise two auditory objects, the first give me a and then the particular meaning of break, determined by the context. And this one, in contrast, is just one unitary auditory object, which is conveyable without the words. You can do it just by the um, tone of voice and the prosody. And of course, the visual information is also <coughs> extremely important. Uh, I'm not going into that, but it's, um, it's very obvious that that will affect things as well. So you're probably all sitting there now saying, well, we already do all of this, and why are you telling us all this? Pattern completion, prediction, task specificity, we know all about it. Yes, it is true that ASR and later on TTS by with uh, unit selection led the way, and I even said so back in 1995. Um, but 
the solutions that have been taken have been um, to do with things like using local transitional probabilities and restricted vocabularies, where I would suggest that the transitional probabilities are very germane to what we're doing, but the restricted vocabulary obviously is, is non-ideal in some particular senses. So let's consider communicative, communicative goals a little bit more seriously than, than I have done so far in terms of meaning and function. If we go back to David Pallett's slide, um, he distinguished spontaneous, conversational and broadcast speech, but they're far from mutually exclusive. And what they actually do is simply describe where you got the corpus from. They've got nothing to do with meaning. They've got nothing to do with the function of what's being said. And it's in terms of the function, I'm going to be arguing now, um, that each bit of speech performs that we need to be thinking about how we analyse things. Um, even in monologues, you can't tell the meaning of many utterances without quite a lot of context. So here's just three words that have, in English, lots and lots of different meanings that are completely unrelated to each other. And then some words, like quite, don't really have a meaning by themselves. But when you combine them with other me words, the meaning might be rather different. So not in American English, I think, but in British English, quite good means not really even average. Um, whereas quite beautiful means extremely beautiful. So you, you have to actually know the, the, um, the dialect that you're talking about. You can't even take a word like quite and get it to qualify other things, and it means the same thing. Um, Pickett and Pollack showed a um, long time ago that you can't even identify words in connected speech unless you've heard about 800 milliseconds or more. And that is true regardless of rate. With, so that faster rates of speech actually need more syllables to be understood and slowing the speech down doesn't help, which is exactly what the sort of thing that Miriam was um, talking about in more detail um, yesterday, and um, she will be glad to hear that this was on the, my slide before um, I realised she was going to be talking the day before me. Um, so if you want to look at new stuff, that's her website. Um, the... Phonetic properties of speech, as she said, um, of e sorry, of each speech style, um, as she said, and of each pragmatic function have to be learned. Their attributes are specific to the language, the regional accent, the age of the speaker, and the situational context. But most of them are present in the sensory signal. And notice I've put sensory there now, not auditory. They're, they're there in the, in the environment in which you are, of which the auditory signal is part. So that... In going back to our break example, the speaker can be both a teenager and the bike mechanic. And the way he says, then, give me, a, give me a break, together with what's preceded his utterance, and in this case, what you think he knows about politeness and about your relationship to him, um, then that will affect the meaning that you attach to his words. So a bike mechanic who's a teenager is... <coughs> is unlikely to say to you, um, give me a break, in the uh, give me a break sort of way. Um, that's another sort of break, yeah. Um, but he would do if it was your son, okay? There's, there's, there's high, very, very strong constraints on when, when you can use those sorts of things. But whatever it is that he is meaning, it affects what you do next, and so it's very important to the success of the interaction. Now, the sorts of observations I've been making tend not to apply to read sentences unless they're being read in a story by a very good role-playing reader. So in corpora, like, for example, Timmit and some of these other ones that we've got, um, no particular meaning is attached to the words by the speakers as they read them. Um, it's perfectly possible to read stuff without really thinking at all about the meaning. And that's why it sounds like red speech. That's why the focus can remain quite effectively on phonemes and word identification because there isn't anything else in the speech signal for you to exploit to work out what was meant. Um, and that's why that sort of analysis has somewhat limited generality to everyday speech. It will apply um, to spontaneous or conversational or broadcast speech um, to a reasonable extent, but only in generic sort of ways. And I'd like to suggest that if we're focusing on monologues, then um, we need to be thinking more on local changes 
in multiple time domains defined by auditory objects and that might help us tie things together in ways that will push the recognition rates a bit higher. I'm not trying to pretend it's easy but I think that's Is this a signal to stop? <laughs> or am I being just so exciting you can't sit still? <laughs> um, yes. Uh, yes, right. <laughs> so the problem with what I'm saying is that, of course, we don't really know what an auditory or a functional object might be. Um, but nevertheless, there is fair evidence that the term is a reasonable neurophysiological metaphor for us to continue at least to push it a bit to see how far it can go. And this is one of the ways now in the last bit of my talk I want to, um, I'm, I'm pushing things here to, to see what we can do with them. And because I think the information might be valuable for people in speech recognition. So I want to ask, could there be interactional objects as well as the sort of static within utterance objects that I'm talking about up to now? Relative to utterances spoken without an interactive context, conversation obviously increases the complexity of what indicates meaning and function. I really don't need to tell you guys that. Um, but what you might like to know is that phonetic detail as well as word choice still systematically indicates the function of things that are doing jobs in making a conversation happen. And this phonetic detail could be exploited if multiple parameters can be bound together, possibly, though not necessarily always, over longer domains. Um, and here is an example of an agreement sequence between two people talking. This is real spontaneous speech. Speaker A, with the yellow panel, says it's supposed to be really, really pretty. And speaker B says, oh, it's supposed to be gorgeous. And so B is affirming what A has just said. She is agreeing. It sounds like this. It's supposed to be really, really pretty. Oh, it's bossy. Gorgeous. It's supposed to be really, really pretty. Oh, it's bossy. Gorgeous. Now, um, A's turn is syntactically complete, prosodically complete. It's a recognisable action in the conversation an analysis framework. And there's a sort of space at the end that allows B to respond. And B's turn relative to A is syntactically parallel, lexically parallel but upgraded, so gorgeous is a stronger word than pretty, and it's phonetically upgraded. It's slower, louder, and an expanded semitone range. And that is a completely law-governed thing about this type of agreement <coughs> sequence. That's what happens when somebody is agreeing with somebody else quite often, if they, use, if they don't just say yes. Um, now here, in, in contrast, is an agreement and disagreement sequence. And you can see that B has got two bits now, one low amplitude and one high amplitude. But um, A's turn is identical. Yes, isn't that good at long last? A says, it's identical to the um, preceding slide, all the same components, syntactically complete and so on. And B says, yes, that's very good news, which if you were just to do the phonemes and then the words, looks like an agreement. It is an agreement, but it's very low amplitude. And it's followed by something very high amplitude, and I reckon speech recognizers could pick this sort of thing up. And B goes on to basically put down A's enthusiasm. But of course, we'll have to pay that out. What it is, is a sequence in which um, it's a, a, a business meeting for um, a, an industrial firm in which they've been waiting for quite a lot of money to come through and it has finally come through. And A is very excited about that because now they're not broke anymore. Um, but B is saying, well, yes, it is nice, but we're going to still be broke because we owe so many other people. We've got to pay the money. It sounds like this. Yes, yeah, isn't that good at long last? That's very good news. Of course, we'll have to pay out a lot of that, I guess. Okay, so you probably couldn't understand that the first time. I'll play it another couple of times. This happens very soon after with not much of a pause, not enough pause, actually, for convenience. And then this one, there's a, uh, it goes on um, with a loud part. Yes, yeah, isn't that good at long last? That's very good news. Of course, we'll have to pay out a lot of that, I guess. And again. Yes, yeah, isn't that good at long last? That's very good news. Of course, we'll have to pay out a lot of that, I guess. 
Okay, so that's the sequence. And um, notice that whereas before we had B's term being syntactically and lexically parallel and <coughs> phonetically upgraded, now it's syntactically matched and parallel, it's lexically parallel, but it's phonetically downgraded. It's softer, faster, and reduced semitone range, which is why you couldn't understand it very well. Those things, I think, are reasonably easy to understand. The words suggest agreement, but the prosody heralds disagreement. And heralds means it's, it's allowing you to predict that um, disagreement is going to be forthcoming. Now, that's just one example, but the fact that I can tell you this sort of thing means that it has been systematized by uh, conversation analysts and it could be systematized in computers, therefore, presumably to some extent. Um, the transition and the function can be defined in terms of a change of torque very often, and that's relatively easy to do. And the upgrades or downgrades that are in the phonetic signal um, are reflected in co-varying prosodic, lexical, and grammatical properties. So a lot of things to pick up on there and then check at different types of levels to see if they're co-varying. Um, and it's always relative to the preceding clusters. So you're not looking inside of one bit here. It's this bit relative to that bit. And then this bit relative to that bit. So you're going back in time to see how one bit matches relative to the bit that went before. I realize that long domains are um, conceptually and technically very difficult. There's lots of change inside them as well as, um, the, uh, you, you know, every, every long domain is made up of a lot of shorter domains. Um, so, and I realize that that's very difficult for um, a lot of um, pattern matching computer systems. So I thought perhaps it, we might go back to the sort of Victor Zoo type of islands of reliability idea and look for some general principles that um, would, if possible, be biologically coherent across a, a number of modalities. And um, the thing I want to show you now then is some very recent data that I've got um, where individuals are coordinating or aligning their behavior probably by temporal entrainment um, and the point is even though I'm suggesting we look at sort of long domains you don't actually need to look at the whole domain you only need to find these anchor points of heightened certainty within um, very um, prescribed short domains. I'm also going to suggest that the modality of entrainment is immaterial, which is extra good if you're doing multimodal stuff. Um, what I've got is um, analyses of pairs of friends who are spontaneously talking together and for 10 minutes or so out of a longer recording session, um, improvising music spontaneously together. And there's a picture here of two women doing this with a, a xylophone and a couple of clap sticks here. The type of analysis I did um, looks like this for, for, this, for the, this particular question that I was asking, where we've got um, the left-hand talker's mouth microphone here and the right one's there. This is a composite spectrogram of the whole sound patterns. These are uh, musical sounds. And there are just two words in here. The right-hand person um, says tribal, and the left-hand person says yeah. And they are making quite a complex musical rhythm. Um, so this is a bit that it goes on a bit longer than what you can see, but this is more or less just the extract from what you're seeing on the screen. Yeah. And what we did was, was take the um, F0 peak in the accented syllable of each of the words, and there's just these two on here, and they're called pikes because they um, after um, uh, Law, who has done this work with gesture as well. Um, but they are, in this case, just F0 maxima or minima. And we took the time of that, and we also transcribed a great personal cost every single flipping musical beat, and then transcribed across into a new tier the pulses from that, the musical pulse or the tactus. 
and then I expressed the difference in timing between the, um, these pikes and the nearest pulse as, as a deviation, and a pulse to pike or P to, P to P deviation. So this deviation is 10% of the whole pulse interval, and this one is about 20% of the whole pulse interval. And it's that measure that I'm talking about now, and that you see in this graph. The musical um, episodes um, were selected on the grounds that the music sounded reasonable, though not necessarily brilliant, but it was music. It wasn't not music. And um, they, there was speech immediately prior to the music making, or during, or after. So all episodes of the, from five pairs of speakers um, that conformed to that were selected. And then they were divided into um, music that was successful. It basically got your foot tapping or it, it sort of worked, but it wasn't, it, it, you didn't get in the groove with that music. Um, that was obviously a subjective um, classification, but it was uh, validated by the standard deviations of the pulses within each of these. The standard deviations of the unsuccessful um, bouts was about twice that of the standard deviation of the pulses of the successful bouts. So the successful bouts were basically just a lot more rhythmic um, and periodic than the unsuccessful ones. Now, um, the dark bars are the successful ones, the grey bars are the uh, unsuccessful ones, and you can see that most of the deviations in both conditions were around 20 to 30 percent of the, um, of the uh, inter-onset interval of the pulses. But when the music was successful, then the distribution was skewed towards smaller deviations. So there was a tighter, uh, a tighter temporal relationship between the musical pulse and the speech pulse. And um, that's not that surprising if you're doing the playing and the speaking all at once. But what was interesting was that quite a lot of these speech episodes um, actually preceded the music. And the music, I forgot to say, was also selected. No, it was music. They didn't know what they were going to play. It wasn't a real tune. It wasn't an existing tune. And, and they didn't count each other in. They just started playing. There are, the people can do this. It, it happens spontaneously quite a lot. There were no instructions that they had to do that. We just waited until we got these sorts of things happening. And the fact that sometimes these, the, they would be talking often about nothing to do with the music at all. And then... Um, they start playing together, and when the music was successful, you've got this much tighter timing. This suggests that the synchronization that we see in the successful music isn't due solely to the musical tactus, but the pulse can actually emerge in the speech prior to the musical pulse being overtly produced. So just like in conversation, when you have to time things correctly, it was, um, they were using the pulse in the conversations to um, set the pulse for the music. And when such temporally aligned speech precedes a successful musical bout then, it seems to seed the musical pulse so that you can actually play and start playing successfully um, really well. Um, the same thing seems to happen in conversational turn taking. Um, there's a paper by Wilson and Wilson in Psychonomic Bulletin and many, many other papers that demonstrate that turn transitions in dialogue are very, very precisely timed and speakers use phonetic devices to project that the end of the term is imminent and the second speaker is sort of listening for this and uses it to come in on time. Now, what has been shown before is that these timing windows are actually quite critical. If you wait for more than two seconds, for example, before you agree with something, it comes over as a disagreement, even if you say yes. Um, what we have done is gone back, and this is extremely tentative because there's not many data points we've had time to do it on yet, but apparently it's not just a critical time window. These people are actually coming in on beat um, in the question-answer sequences that we've checked out since discovering the musical stuff that I just showed you. What we've found is that the last two to three pikes in a question have relatively equal inter-onset intervals, even though the rest of the speech doesn't have equal inter-onset intervals in these pikes. And at least the initial pike of the answer is often rhythmically synchronized. So you get a speaker coming to the end of a turn, and then in the last two to three accented syllables, they get more rhythmic. And then no matter when that other person comes in, whether there's quite a gap before they come in or if they come in on the next beat, it is the same period. 
And so it's as if you're providing a bit of periodicity for the listener to align their behavior with. Um, so there's also a lot of converging behavioral and neuroscientific evidence in the literature that supports this idea of being um, a, as being a reasonable hypothesis to continue to explore. It seems that signal regularities don't just capture um, uh, attention, but they actually entrain attention. And so you end up with whoever is doing the listening all becoming entrained with the speaker. And that allows them all to predict future behavior. And I'm suggesting this could be an important substrate of successful coordinated interaction because the literature demonstrates that rhythmic predictability dominates at these particular times, and this can be in speech or music or dance um, or other types of movement. Um, when you want the listener to particularly attend, when you want to give up your turn or indicate a change of subject, yet maintain continuity, when you want the listener to affiliate with you, which means basically to like you, um, and when there are few competing constraints. So the implications are that each auditory perceptual um, object should identify an anchor for an appropriate level of analysis. Um, it should reduce uncertainty about future decisions and reduce uncertainty about past ones. And therefore, I'm suggesting it might be worth trying to track it in unrestricted dialogue. Um, with functional objects, such as agreement or disagreement and questions and answers, reducing uncertainty across turns by providing information about what type of interaction is taking place. So if, for example, you found that you've got decreased period periodicity in an object in the vicinity of a turn transition, then perhaps the interaction is going to be dysfunctional and therefore you might look for different types of words um, and if you've got to make choices between um, word types. So to summarize then, the key concepts that I've been talking about are meaning and communicative function in context. Attention, memory, prediction and pattern matching are fundamental to those. But they can only be used, I think, effectively in polysystemic systems. That means, for example, going back to the prefixes, what those dissyllables do and resyllables and so on do when they're a prefix, what they do in different styles of speech and different prosodic contexts is quite different from what the phonemically identical or similar syllables will do in those same different styles of speech. It's a polysystemic system. There's a system which for prefixes, which they must obey if they're going to sound like prefixes. And there's a system for non-prefixes with the same phonemic structure. And they, it's a different system. But of course, you have to understand the interrelationships between them, and it is extremely complicated. Um, but it may be worth worrying about, at least for the more important types of things, which may not indeed be prefixes. They may be other types of things. Um, information then will be weighted according to its value in the present task and the situation and mapped to meaning as directly as possible with big or long units outweighing smaller units when they compete closely in probability values. The linguistic units themselves need only be identified um, when, when you need them and they can be identified in whatever order makes best sense in, in, the, in the signal. So you might identify a big unit and then just go down and check that the patterns you've got for the smaller units are congruent with that or con compatible with that. With differences in the time required for their identification outweighing differences between the linguistic levels. And so what I'm suggesting is that you can manage uncertainty by targeting your searches in identified contexts according to um, predicted functions or, or already identified functions. And um, to do this, you, can reduce, you will reduce your choices um, by identifying these targeted search areas as islands of reliability, if you like, but they're on multiple levels. Um, and you will raise probabilities if you seek then compatible units that are clustering with each other, but across the different levels. And um, to do that, unfortunately, you will have to, I suspect, track quite a lot of temporal regularities. But the news isn't all bad because they can be short domain. Now, uh, that's the end of the talk. And I'm, um, I've gone for a bit longer than was probably wanted. But if some of you don't know much about illusions, I've got a most fabulous one I can show you if you want. 
So it's up to you. <laughs> Thank you. not a stooge, he just said it. This is the hollow head. Actually at the moment it's a perfectly normal head of Charlie Chaplin, but wait, as it comes round you'll see, or will you, that it's hollow. The back of it coming round now is actually a hollow mask. It appears to rotate in the opposite direction and amazingly the nose sticks out, although it's actually sticking in. Coming round now is the normal, correct as it were, face. And wait again as it comes round. And you'll see this extraordinary thing like Jekyll and Hyde. Both the noses stick out because it's so unlikely that a nose sticks in, that a face is hollow. So you see it as convex, although it's in fact concave as now and then it'll become the normal face again, there. And note that as soon as the features appear in the hollow inside, it will look convex as though it's a normal face almost, though it isn't. As soon as the features appear, there. Your brain refuses to see it as hollow simply because it is so unlikely. And this demonstrates the immense power of top-down knowledge, which will actually counter signals bottom-up from the senses and force an extraordinary illusion in which the sensory information of the present is cancelled by immense knowledge derived from the past because you've seen so many faces all with their noses sticking out. So it's just impossible to see that as correctly hollow. Martin has a question. Okay. Thanks, Sarah. Um, Not just quite good. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, do you use internal objects? I'm trying to understand where the bounds of this term are. It's called the term. Mm. I think it's slightly different way. Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot to say. Actually, no, it's it's Bregman's term that I'm trying to just extend. Well, it, what Bregman means, as I understand it, is it seems to be a positive description of the term acoustic source, which has been separated from other acoustic sources throughout that. I guess you mean something slightly different. You have auditory objects in a single source, in a single stream of speech. Well, that's the metaphor that I'm trying to use. You can call it anything else you like, like a chunk or something, you know. But the, the thing with Bregman, I think, is that, I mean, you know, he's a psychoacoustician and he was interested in source separation, and so he related it to sources. But you have to know about sources to start doing things like that, I think, as well. Um, and we're somewhat hardwired to know about them. I'm not trying to say it's, it's all learned. Some of it's clearly not. Um, but, um, for example, the, 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 um, when you've got a, a sort of little galloping rhythm of tones and you've got pitches um, that are either close together or far apart, I don't know if you've heard these illusions, but you certainly have. Um, when they're close together, you, people tend to hear things coming from one source. When they're far apart, you'll hear them as from two sources. And this has been known for centuries. Bach exploited it in, 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 in his work. So did all the other Baroque composers. Um, but that sort of thing, um, if you're actually not just listening to sine wave tones, but you're listening to something out in the real world, I suspect you need to know about things like birds. In, in the real world. I mean, anyone that's gone to a completely different culture and, um, and come across something that um, is, is quite unknown knows that the first few times you hear something, you don't necessarily as ascribe it to the right sources. Um, so in that sense, I think Bregman, uh, you, you know, I mean, he, he... 
I think he could have extended it further, but he was busy doing experiments, proving his concept, rather than thinking what it might mean for speech recognition by machines. <laughs> Well, they're only important, to, I'm only talking about diachronic stuff, stuff that's important now in this accent at, in, at the moment. Um, so some of the morphemes that I'm talking about as pseudomorphemes were once prefixes. Uh, sorry, some of the syllables I'm talking about as pseudomorphemes were once prefixes, and over time they've lost that meaning and become stuck to the word. Um, if you've got a language which deletes the morphemes, that means it's not very important. There are plenty of languages that don't have any morphemes at all, but bound morphemes, that is, and they function perfectly well. And um, you have to do different things to express the time, same type of meaning, though. That, so the prefix example, I'm not saying all bound morphemes are going to necessarily be really, really important at all times, but they're almost certainly more important than phonemes. No, I, I'm fine with that. Um, the point of view that I take is that a phonemic system, I, I don't think there's any language, I mean someone like Mark, who's unfortunately not really with us at the moment, but <laughs> he, he would know much better than I do about things like um, morpheme systems in, in languages, but I'm not aware that, uh, uh, sorry, phoneme systems in languages, I'm not aware of any language that is, um, it's really easy to identify all the phonemes in it. It's certainly not in English. And um, in some, some of the Chinese languages are just not amenable to, morph to phonemic analysis at all. They, it just doesn't make any sense. You could do it, but it's really forced. And um, what I would, but that's again talking about phonological systems. Um, put that into brains, and I would think that there are some sounds that are sufficiently um, contextually insensitive, if you like, that they function pretty much as phonemes, if you like, because they're also anchor points. So S in English <coughs> is a good example. It doesn't change that much across, across contexts. Um, labial sounds are probably in English pretty good because they don't change much across context and you've also got the visual information which is extremely powerful. But sounds like T, um, you may not have a clear phonemic identity for that until you learn to read the alphabetic writing system that we happen to use. Sounds like <laughs> th and f, similarly, certainly in the accent area I come from where most ths are pronounced f. Um, if I can indulge in a little dialogue, uh, a little anecdote, my son, um, who happily said f for everything because that's what all the other kids said, so he said um, thistle and that sort of thing for thistle. Um, when he learnt to read, he discovered there was a difference. Um, some, some of his f words began with th and some of his f words began with f. I don't think he knew yet that others began with ph, but put that aside. Within three days, he'd sorted it out because he could read pretty well um, words. And so he started then pronouncing things um, <coughs> correctly according to um, standard English. And that isn't that uncommon. So I think you'll have phonemes um, or things that function as phonemes, but you don't have a complete phonemic system. And if you don't have a complete phonemic system, then you can't really use it very well. Yeah, so that things can be acoustic anchor points, and they would be prime things to function like phonemes. You can call them phonemes if you like, it doesn't worry me. <laughs> Yeah. 
If the speech rate was so high that you could barely understand what the person was saying, possibly not, I'm not certain. But my observation, and I've been observing these for many years because it's, as you know, something that's been worrying me for a long time. My observation is the contrast is always maintained. So you can get prefix disses pronounced a bit in fast, very, very fast speech, a bit more like non-prefix disses. The overlap in any case is statistically fairly high. Um, and, well, sorry, that's not clear. Acoustically, the over, in acoustic measurements, there's quite a lot of overlap, but it's statistically significant. And now we've shown it's perceptually significant as well. Um, and um, it, the contrast is always maintained, so that if you say um, displays, I can do it better with disco uh, discover and discolor, so I'll, 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 I'll do that. So if you say discolor, and then you say it very fast, it can become discolour. Um, but in that same speech style, then the dis of discover is going to be something that's it's got so minimal periodicity in it, it's practically just the S, and so it's much, much lighter rhythmically. Uh, right, okay. Uh, so, so are you saying, would they be able to hear the difference still? Or are you saying, would they be able to do it during the, during the actual syllable? Well, I don't think that's important to the point that I'm making. Um, the, the point is that they would make the distinction, and then they would do it as soon as you can do it however long it takes. I mean, so for a reaction time, for example, it takes about 250 milliseconds just to press a button once you've decided to do it. It takes about 200 milliseconds just to move your eyes. So if the syllables, and many of our syllables did take less, um, I mean, some of them, I think the shortest was 33 milliseconds long. It was a rip. And um, so obviously the eyes didn't move actually during that time, but they moved 200 milliseconds later relative to that time. Do you see? So I, th I think people could still process the information because the contrast would still be there, the acoustic contrast. But it wouldn't, it w it wouldn't no, it wouldn't be happening during the syllable then, but the processing would be happening during the syllable. Or as soon as processing happens. <laughs> Just um, a quick comment. Thank you, Sarah, for fixing a very challenging agenda to people who are working on automatic speech recognition and understanding. We thought we were almost at the end, but still you, we have just restart everything. <laughs> uh, or oh, you could just ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> The speaker thinks you do anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and um, that's why, uh, in the same line as uh, Miriam, um, for the, this prefix uh, experiment, if, it, um, if you have the information in other levels, you, you might have uh, very few information to, to make some disambiguation of these um, uh, prefixes. Yeah, that's true. I mean, this, this experiment was designed specifically to try to get at the idea that meaning is important and phonemes don't necessarily help you get to meaning. I'm certainly not saying they never do and people don't have any phonemes at all in their heads and stuff like that. Once you can read an alphabetic writing system, you do have some phonemes in your head because you can't read it otherwise. Um, but you have to be taught it. You're not born that way. You learn it after you've learned the language. 
And, um, and as I say, I don't think it's completely consistent. I know that, I mean, I can, I can get 100% in a phonemic, phonemic transcription test if I concentrate on what I'm doing. But I also know that some of the things I'm doing I don't agree with because for me those sounds are not in the same phoneme. I've just learned. If I want to get 100%, that's what I do. Um, but if I take the pronunciation of the vowel O, for example, in whole and pole and compare it with hope and pope, those are completely different sounds to me, but they are the same phony. Um, it's just the context makes them different. But to me, they're not different, and they never will be different. And I hone to that difference because it's part of my identity as a dialect speaker. Um, and there are other things like that as well. Um, I'm not certain I've answered your question, actually, though, have I? Oh, okay, thanks. Yep.